Well, hello there, and welcome to my first video in almost two years. It's crazy to think that much time has passed, but apparently it has. And I first want to just say I'm still alive. I've just been crazy busy. I got three little ones now running around, and they keep my life full of chaos and love, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I still have my job, and it's actually been keeping me on the road quite a bit too. So that combination has just been keeping my free time to a limited amount but I still try to maximize that amount. And so for instance, I was able to go to Comic-Con recently, a couple weeks ago, I guess, and uh, picked up some goodies, met some cool celebrities like this guy, the Kurgan, one of the greatest movie villains of all time. And uh, thank you, Clancy, by the way, for signing that. I know Nickelodeon was like, you're not supposed to sign that, you only sign the posters we provide. And he's like, I just signed what's in front of me. And so luckily they didn't confiscate it or something. Uh, then it was the moment when I made Patrick Stewart, Captain Picard, cry. Well, oh, here it goes. Um, the honor has all been mine. It's just a very powerful, emotional moment, and definitely probably the highlight of con for me. Anyways, on to today's subject on retro computing. While I'm not on the hunt every weekend like I used to be, going to state sales and things like that, I still like to dabble in the market. And I was able to pick up this fine specimen about a year and a half ago. It's a 6809 computer from Southwest Technical Products Corporation. Now this was like the top of the line product from that company and a top of the line computer from that era, which was 1979. This was actually used at the University of Missouri to conduct thermal analysis on plants with the Department of Forestry. What really impressed me were the date codes for the disks that came with it because I could see that this computer was used from 1981 until 1997. I mean that's a huge span of time, especially for that era. Basically it was used pre-IBM PC until a couple of years after Windows 95 was around. I mean, that department was definitely committed. Um, also, I was able to play with the different programs, utilities, languages, and even develop a game for this system that I'm definitely wanting to show you. I'm very happy with the result. Um, what really impressed me more than anything, though, for this computer were the operating systems that were available for it. So you had a single user system called Flex, which was a flexible operating system. It had a lot of different command options, dozens of them, and it required only eight kilobytes of RAM. It also started in like a few seconds. So it's funny how the further you go back, the faster and more efficient programs were. Just saying, just an observation. Also, there were some multitasking, multi-user operating systems like OS 9 Level 1 and 2 and Uniflex, which was a clone of Unix, again, for an 8-bit 6809 computer. Just impressive all the way around. This thing was doing things that the IBM PC wasn't doing until like the mid-80s. Now, before I talk more about this computer, let's actually take a look back at the history of the company who made it, SWTPC. And for that, we're going to have to go to 1964 to a little old town called San Antonio, Texas. 1964, The Fugitive was in its second season, the Beatles were playing the Ed Sullivan Show, and a guy named Daniel Meyer was starting his very own company. Daniel had been writing articles on how to assemble his electronic kits starting all the way back in 1959 for magazines such as Radio Electronics and Electronics World. It wasn't until 1963 though where he made his big breakthrough by making the cover of Popular Electronics with his ultrasonic listening device. It was at this point where he saw an opportunity where he could sell the parts needed to assemble his device directly to the buyer. In 1964, he started his own company called the Daniel E. Meyer Company, or Demco. He began by selling kits for articles by Don Lancaster and others to jumpstart his business. His only other employee was his housekeeper, Lucy Proctor, who helped prepare the circuit boards and managed all the orders. This was all done out of his very own home. In 1967, he changed the company to Southwest Technical Products Corporation and moved the business to a much larger site at 219 West Rhapsody. I stopped by their old facility while on a business trip earlier this year, which only confused my Uber driver, but since it was close enough to the airport, it didn't really matter. As they entered the 70s, Southwest was getting a reputation as an excellent kit supplier with high quality devices for affordable prices. Audiophiles still seek out their preamps and tiger amps as they were considered high standards for the day. One of the more interesting and unique devices they sold was the Psychtone, one of the earliest sequencer based synthesizers ever made, being sold in early 1971. I've only heard like 100 of these were sold, as it was extremely complex to build even for experienced kit builders. It had 28 controls with 1,728 different 63-note sequences to produce over 100,000 melodic lines. 
Now, somehow I was actually able to snag one of these earlier this year. I mean, it's essentially just a random note generator that used three rotary switches and three knobs to control the pitch and to generate the 63 note patterns. But for the time, it was obviously very innovative, even though today it's basically just a novelty. In 1973, they released something called the TV typewriter, which was kind of a pseudo terminal. It wouldn't be until 1975, around the debut of the Altair, when they released their first full-fledged terminal called the CT1024 for $275. This could store 1,024 bytes, hence its name. Later that year, Daniel asked one of his engineers, Gary Kay, if he could design a new computer built using the Motorola 6800. Since Gary was the only employee who had any experience with any sort of computer, he really had no choice but to build this. Southwest had a long-standing partnership with Motorola, so using that technology just made the most sense. In late 1975, the 6800 computer was officially released. It was quite a departure from the Altair and similar units. It was basically just a big box with two buttons on the front. With the Altair, the user had to enter in commands using switches on the front. These 16 switches represented a bit, with the up position being a 1 and the down position being a 0. This was a true binary interface, and as close to a computer as one could get. Obviously, this was extremely time consuming, as you would have to enter the instructions bit by bit into the computer. The secret to the success of the 6800 was that it had an operating system stored in ROM. This meant that it was truly a plug and play style operation, assuming the person had a terminal. You'll notice that there are a whopping 15 different slots with different bus sizes on the motherboard. Southwest created their own custom SS50 bus when 100 was the standard, and this was in order to fit more cards onto the machine. You had seven SS50 slots for the CPU card, memory cards, and controllers. Then you had eight different SS30 slots for whatever IO devices you could think of, the standard being terminals, printers, and disk drives. These eight slots are extremely similar to the eight slots found on the Apple II, both in their arrangement and in their purposes. They both identify them as slots 0 through 7, and they have specific I.O. addresses to control them. For instance, slot number 6 is specifically used for accessing disk drives on both computers. The big difference is in the type of connection used. I can show you an example on my 6809 since it uses the same type of connections as the 6800. These are called Molex connectors, and they're male on the motherboard side and female on the add-on card side. Using the Molex connectors made the computer very hacker friendly, which was attractive to the type of user base who wanted this computer. By the end of 76, Southwest had about a 10% market share in the personal computer space. It is a pretty good number, even though there were only about 40,000 computers sold at the time. During this time, there were dozens of different startup companies who sold their own computers, often ran by the engineers who built them. And while these engineers certainly knew about computers, they didn't know so much about how to run a business. Shipping, customer service, support, quality assurance, branding, manufacturing, these were all characteristics needed for a good business model. As a result, many of them folded within a year. Southwest had all these things. They had a brand that everybody knew and respected. They had their own manufacturing facilities on site. They knew how to deliver quality products on time. The total cost for a fully capable machine was about $500, which gave it a financial advantage against its competitors. For a little while, the most common type of mass storage device was to use a cassette tape. The tones could be recorded onto them and the computers could interpret what they meant. The only problem with this was that manufacturers were using all different types of methods to do this. And so in 1975, there was a meeting in Kansas City that took place that standardized this method, and Southwest quickly created the AC30 cassette recorder as a result. A very capable version of BASIC soon became available, first as a 4K version and then later as an 8K version. It was sold at a fraction of the cost compared to other versions of BASIC for other computers, and so it was very popular. Another much needed peripheral would be a printer, and Southwest had the genius idea of using the same printer mechanism used in cash registers for their computers. This reason was such a great idea because printers typically cost over $1,000 back in 1976, but Southwest was able to sell their PR40 for $250. It was limited to only 40 characters per line, but that was still a great deal. Steve Jobs even wrote an article about how to use it with an Apple I. The next major milestone in storage was the floppy disk drive system, and they had the 8 inch and 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk drives. Part of the beauty of owning a system like this is that you can choose from whichever terminal you want, and some of these are absolutely gorgeous. I actually have three different types of terminals, which I somehow was able to get all within a month, and I've been looking for years. I have a CT82 from Southwest, 
I have a couple of two-tone blue ADM 3As and a Heath Sternberger. All right, so now let's dig into the software. So immediately upon boot up, you are entered into the built-in operating system called Swatbug, originally Micbug when Motorola provided it. You can see I can examine memory addresses, I can change the values, and when I go back to it, it shows the new value that I entered. If you enter D or U, it'll automatically boot up the five and a quarter or eight inch floppy disk drive. Remember I mentioned that you have specific IO addresses tied to some of those slots. So this is actually flex that I've just loaded. I'm gonna go back to the monitors for a second though, because I wanna show you that when I go back to those same addresses, notice that it has different values. Those are the actual addresses where it stores the month, day, and year, 13 being the binary equivalent to 19. If you enter G, you go back to flex, and here I can examine the files on a disk. I can search for specific files. So one meaning I'm looking at disk drive number one for a file named Star Trek. If I want to just see all of the files that have a command extension, I can do that. To run a program, you just enter the name. You don't have to enter in .cmd if that's the extension. To load a program, you need to use the git command. I use Sleuth to look at what memory addresses it is and the size of it. Also, it tells me the transfer address. This is all really useful if you want to do something with this. If you want to add it to another program, if you want to save this as a different extension or something. What I like to do is download files from the internet and then using an emulator, I will load the file and then convert the code into cassette tape code. And that way I can send it over a serial line to my computer and that's how I actually get software onto it. I know there's more efficient ways of doing this. It works well if all you have is an old computer, a new computer and a serial cable. Now, once you have sent over that S1 cassette code, you can then save your file just like I'm doing now. You wanna use this particular syntax so you have the starting address, then the ending address, then the transfer address. Now I can check my catalog and there's the new file. So I can run that program and play some Star Trek. This is yet another version of that classic Star Trek game that was basically ported to every single computer, including this one, and it's been floating around since 1971. Here's another 70s classic Lunar Lander ported at some point in the 80s for this computer. And you can see it's a pretty faithful port and exactly what you would expect. All right, so I have one more game I want to show you, and this one's kind of special for me because I wrote it. It's called 6809 Cribbage, and I got it right here. This is a game that was supposed to be just a small project. Maybe it would take about four weeks to write, and it ended up taking several months to write this, really because I became kind of a perfectionist at the game, but also because it's been a while since I've programmed, so I had to relearn a lot of the things that I had known when I did the Apple II games, for instance, that was on the 6502 processor. This was the 6809, obviously, so I had to learn 6809 assembly code, which is something I've wanted to do anyways. And so it was kind of a fun excuse just to learn that. And this is just a dream machine for an assembly programmer. It was an absolute delight to learn this system and to write something fun to play on it. And this game actually ended up requiring 48 kilobytes to run, which is a lot for an 8-bit text-only game. Just to give you some perspective, there are 1K chess programs out there. So compared to those, this thing is bloated. But it was a really fun experience, and I really wanted to make this game the absolute best it could be. And so it has a lot of features. It's kind of like filled to the brim with uh, really cool stuff. And so I have ASCII art. I have animations, a super intelligent AI opponent. I have a lot of movie references from the 80s. And then obviously there are some Easter eggs. I mean, what game would be complete without Easter eggs in it? So when you combine all those things, yeah, it takes up about 48 kilobytes. There's a little bit of wiggle room in there in case I ever need to add some stuff, but like 99% of it is used for some important purpose. So what I want to do now is actually put this in the floppy disk drive and show you what it looks like. So because I wanted the user to be able to use any terminal they want, assuming that it has 80 columns, I pose this question to them. I say, if you have one of the following terminals with cursor addressing facilities, then enter yes. Otherwise, it'll just be the default game. If they enter yes, it takes advantage of those features. And I think it's about seven or eight kilobytes that I've dedicated just to the animation, such as this intro and then other areas of the game too. 
So I wanted to have kind of a cool style introduction, the guy holding a trident that is made out of a cribbage board. You can go to the instructions to learn how to play cribbage. And let me just show you a quick tour. All right, let's play a new game and I'll just kind of quickly go through this. This is not gonna be a lesson on how to play cribbage. For that, you'll have to look at my instruction screen. So I won the deal and that means I get the crib. So I wanna give myself two favorable cards that'll hopefully work out well. He starts, so he's got a seven. I got a seven, so I got a pair. And of course he's got a pair royale, lovely. 31 for two, 15 for two, well, one for last. He's got 10, decent hand, and I have a slight lead. So that's one round, and you basically just continue playing that until you get the threshold, which in this case is 121 points. So first to get that wins, and I just love cribbage. I've always loved it, and I love teaching my friends about it, and then they fall in love with it. And it's just a really exciting game. Now, the computer opponent, he'll throw out some taunts here and there, and also you get like a special ending if one of you skunk the other. And I'm not going to spoil all of that, but there's just a lot of alternate endings, which are kind of cool. Well, this about concludes my video on the Southwest Technical Products Corporation company and the 6809 computer. This particular model of the computer is the S00, which is identical to the S09. It allowed you to have a 20-bit address bus for addressing up to 756K of RAM. It also had a built-in dynamic memory management system allowing you to allocate a set amount of RAM as small as four chunks to individual users or tasks. You could also have it configured to run at one or two megahertz. There was also the 69K and 69A, the latter of which I also own. It had a slightly different motherboard configuration. There were also many clones made of the 6800 and 6809, including the smoke signal broadcasting chieftain seen here complete with imitation leather. Yeah, they were really going all out for this Native American theme. I'm also fortunate enough to own a Gimmicks Ghost 6809, which is a souped up clone and famously used by Eugene Jarvis to produce many of the classic Williams games that we all love, such as Defender and my all time favorite, Robotron. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.